Well, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. You're a wonderful uh, bunch of people. I've had a good opportunity at some of the networking events to, to talk with some of you and learn about the fine work you're doing, uh, including one person that's looking at the effect of vitamin D, of all things, on how high a ballerina can jump. And uh, we, I enjoyed reviewing that abstract, as well as many of the others from the, those of you that have submitted abstracts, and just enjoyable conversations with uh, people I see in the audience here that I've had over the past 48 hours. So thanks to each of you. May I ask you a quick question? Uh, could you raise your hand if you saw the uh, avant-garde avant -garde wooden clock when you come in the lobby? Could you raise your hand if you've seen that clock? It's got a pendulum swinging back and forth, created by a wood sculptor, uh, and caught my attention when I came in. In fact, it almost became an obsession. And uh, I, it, I thought a lot about it and you know, consulted with a manager and the engineer who maintains it. They have to wind it every two days. And it takes quite a bit of maintenance to keep it from self-destructing. And uh, so it kind of is a model for cancer of a finely tuned clock, in a sense, that, or any instrument, that uh, you've got to look after to keep it from decomposing. And, uh, but as I looked at it, I didn't imagine there would be a real-world experiment in which someone had manhandled a model of this clock, of all things, at the National Clock Museum in Pennsylvania, and it was under surveillance camera. So uh, there's a, a video that went viral. A million people now have seen this man touching the, the wooden clock and reducing it to nothing, to shreds. And so I'd like you to see it as an analogy for what I'll be talking to you about regarding the need for preserving normal function in order to prevent the chaos that is cancer. So if we could have the, uh, the YouTube, How please. many seconds does it take for a man to break this priceless clock, ignoring the rules of nearly every museum on earth, which state do not touch? <laughs> about 15. <laughs> Let's rewind and explain how we got to this mess. A man and woman approach a wooden clock sculpture at the National Watch and Clock Museum in Columbia, Pennsylvania. After taking a photo, the man gets a closer look at the clock and begins tugging and yanking parts of it, seemingly in an attempt to make it run. Of the 1,500 clocks on display, some of them don't constantly run, and museum staffers who've watched the video on repeat think the man was trying to get it to start. After touching the clock some more, he got it moving all right, and watched time stand still as it fell off the wall completely smashing on the ground he tries to hang it back on the wall but it's no use the museum posted the video to instagram and used it as a teaching moment with the caption this is why we beg visitors not to touch museum <laughs> objects despite media reports saying the man ran off the museum director says he actually went to get help the museum is not pressing charges and the clock can be fixed in-house it'll just take some time a few months to be exact <laughs> i'm sean dowling for buzz 60 now you know pass it on so next time you look at that clock as you come in or out of the lobby, uh, you know, you'll know that it's, it's a quite a fragile item. Uh, could you raise your hands if you're staying here at the hotel? Just so I have a feeling, oh, quite a few of you are, so you will see that clock uh, time and time again as you come out of the, uh, the in and out of the lobby. Well, good. Well, let's go to the next slide, please. And this just, just tells you that I don't accept any money from any organizations. Uh, there it is, none, and then I'll press it, and there we go. This is our learning objectives. This is in print so you can read it yourself, the clinical actions that you'll be able to take when I'm done talking to you about this. Uh, this lecture is dedicated uh, to Dr. Frank Garland, one of a member of three of a team that co-discovered that vitamin D deficiency is the cause of breast and colon cancer. And uh, we have him in our heart. Uh, this all happened at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health Department of Epidemiology back in the middle of just about, well, a little past the middle of the past century. And as you can see, we're lucky to have survived the street in front of this uh, School of Public Health. It's a, a daunting task to even get into the School of Public Health. And even the photographer got caught up in it, showing the, the speedy traffic that goes past it. Next one, please. Or I can do it myself. Here we go. So at any rate, on one hot, sultry July afternoon, my brother and I were sitting in a small conference room in the Johns Hopkins School of Hygiene, and uh, a gentleman, Robert M. Hoover, from the National Cancer Institute came and said, uh, you know what, we were directed by the president to make maps of the United States showing the death rates from cancer in each of the 3,056 counties 
We didn't much like the assignment. It's been drudgery. We actually hate it, but what, now we have to figure out what to do with it. He said, you guys are the nearest and oldest school of public health in the country, so we decided to start with you and see if you can make any sense out of it. Well, he started at the top of the head, and almost all the cancers were red, which is the high rate, around Richmond, Virginia, not too far from where we are now. And everybody knew, well, we know why that is, for crying out loud, if it's head and neck cancers or lung cancer. But eventually, when he got to the bowel, which took a while, by this time, most of the members of the audience had already tuned out. We saw a lot of glazed eyes, except for my brother and I, who were in the front row. And this was our very first seminar as neophyte epidemiologists, me as an assistant professor, my brother as a PhD student at Hopkins. So we kept watching, and then this came up, and we thought, well, why is the death rate only half below Virginia? If you look, draw a line through Virginia, some people call this the waistline of America. But as you, you can see, you can go from left to right, for people on this side, you can go from you know, across America through the bottom of our very state that we occupy at this very moment in time, and you'll see that the rates are shockingly low. The blue means that they're in the very, very bottom uh, of the whole distribution from like about 9 to 15 per 100,000 deaths. These are age adjusted compared to the rest of the country, which is quite a bit higher. And in particular, compared to the northeastern part of the country, where the rate, while it's, you know, down around 10 or so in the south, is 45 in the borough of Manhattan. So if you're from the borough of Manhattan, you're in the crosshairs for colon cancer, and I hope you'll listen especially carefully uh, to this presentation. <laughs> now, when we first looked at it, my brother and I kind of poked each other and said, well, we know what that is, for crying out loud. We had just driven across America in an old Mustang from San Diego, originating here, um, all the way to Baltimore, and we knew how much sun there was in the south because we didn't have any AC. And the message was made very clear to us. So it didn't take a moment to say, it, for crying out loud, and we didn't cry out loud because it was a rather distinguished gathering of uh, <laughs> rather conservative epidemiologists, but we were both thinking it. It's the sun that's preventing this disease of all crazy things. We had no idea what, how we were going to spend our careers, what we would work on. But this one moment on that sultry July afternoon uh, changed forever the whole course of my life that of my brother and ultimately a third colleague, Dr. Gorham, who joined us when we returned to California, our native home. Um, so that moment was this realization, and my life actually has been devoted to uh, supporting this by doing various studies in order to convince skeptical colleagues that uh, it can't be true. Everyone, everyone knows better, of course, than the sun being able to prevent anything. But anyway, what we've done here is some contours and I'll tell you a little more about them. But what they show you is that the sun down in the area like of Arizona, New Mexico, and parts of Texas to the west is really hot. This is about as intense as the sun gets anywhere in the world. It's like sub-Saharan Africa. There's so much sun there. And uh, there's so little if you go to the upper right. So it's 500 calories per square centimeter in the southwest versus it's red way up in the northeast at 300, and that is a huge difference. Among other things, you can't take your clothing off for much of the year in the Northeast because it's too cold. It's just too cold. And if you can't take your clothing on, you're not going to make any of a particular compound of interest to our group, vitamin D3. Well, it turns out that if you look at the pattern for breast cancer mortality rates, there are considerable similarities. Let's look at Arizona, New Mexico, Western Texas, you see the rates are startlingly low, half, half what they are in other places. And just like uh, colon cancer, if you happen to live in the borough of Manhattan, uh, you are going to have a rate that's going to be at least triple that anywhere else in the country. So again, if you're in New York or you're going there, I'm, I know there's some members of the audience that are headed that way, um, be careful. Uh, watch out. Uh, <laughs> So this is, a, if it seems a stern warning, it's intended to, to, to let you know why we got started along a course that was ultimately to be our entire careers. Um, and some people have asked me, and they have asked this from the outset, 
uh, why is it higher in the Northeast than it is in the Northwest? And we spent five years working on that, and we found that there is a pr Arctic air mass that blows down. Those of you that have lived in the Great Lakes or particularly in New York know it. It's just so cold that you can't stand it, whereas in the um, western part of the United States, there's more influence of the Pacific Ocean. And you don't get this horrible cold Arctic air mass that extends the winter and makes it so cold. And that's one of the reasons. The second is that in the New York uh, area, there's a huge demand for energy, just to even supply the borough of Manhattan. And uh, it's so great that they burn a lot of coal. And that coal contains sulfur. It's from the Pennsylvania Valley. Sulfur produces sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide combines with ammonia to form sodium, uh, combines with ammonia to form a compound that uh, blocks the ultraviolet B from the sun. It's called ammonium sulfate. It stays in the atmosphere. The most famous example of it is uh, when JFK Jr. was flying to Martha's Vineyard, he got lost in a mass that was not described as a cloud nor as fog, but it was rather the acid haze produced by uh, sulfate air pollution from the generation of electricity uh, for New York. And uh, it's particularly intense there. It just doesn't let ultraviolet B through. Without ultraviolet B, you cannot make vitamin D. So this could, it's not us, but it could have been my brother and I looking at these maps and <laughs> trying to divine what they meant. Uh, and this, of course, was at the top of our consciousness, again, having driven uh, <laughs> east just moments, it seemed, before. So we wrote the paper, Do Sunlight and Vitamin D Reduce the Likelihood of Colon Cancer? And it was difficult to get it published, but finally it was accepted by the International Journal of Epidemiology and allowed us to propose, to our knowledge, for the first time, that vitamin D prevents cancer. Uh, I'll say it was controversial. We had to draw this for it because no one had recently drawn a map of the, the sunlight in the United States. And um, this was a, a key drawing that was included in that publication. Just as a quick review on vitamin D, uh, it's only made by UVB light, which is less than half a percent of total sunlight. And what happens is that four photons of UVB combined with one molecule of 70 hydrocholesterol, a very common form of cholesterol in the skin, and that makes one molecule of vitamin D. It doesn't even change the molecular weight. It's just, it just rearranges it, and it becomes a very potent prohormone. This again shows that it starts out as 70 hydrocholesterol, becomes pre-vitamin D3 with um, the influence of the sun. The warmth of the skin converts it to cholecalciferol, gets in the plasma, in the liver and actually in all tissues just about in which it's been studied, it also can be converted and the metabolite is called 25 hydroxy vitamin D. There's a thousand times more of this metabolite than any other. It has a half-life of three weeks. Most of them have a half-life measured in days or hours. And it's the one that we measure to study the influence of vitamin D on human health. Now, just to show you the intensity of the problem, we plot the incidence of cancer, age-adjusted incidence of cancers according to latitude. And this is a quick screen as to whether sunlight has any influence on the risk of the disease, because if it does, then chances are vitamin D does too. And we know that it's been plotted correctly uh, with a certain sign, and that is, you notice, if you look at the, the horizontal axis, uh, let's go back one here, horizontal axis, you'll see that uh, the northern latitudes are shown as positive, the southern latitudes are shown as negative. And that allows us to look, they have a, a plot that helps us to separate the two hemispheres. And we know we've done it right when New Zealand comes out in the upper left, because New Zealand is the cancer capital of the world. This is true for almost every cancer, including the, the ones we're talking about today. If it's not there, we know we're in trouble. And it's down as far near the uh, Antarctic as you get of habitable places in the southern hemisphere. And the other indicator that it's plotted correctly is that Iceland is at the upper right. And you know Iceland. You know what it's like there if you stop to think about it for a moment. It's not the warmest country on the face of the earth. And it's at such a high latitude that there's almost no ultraviolet B. Now, what's shocking is that the USA is highest of all. You know, we brag about how we're making such strides against breast cancer. Well, then how come we're the highest in the world if our methods are the best on earth for preventing it? Uh, it's a bad sign that we have the highest rate of anybody. 
Uh, kind of shocking. Now this, draw, this, this line is drawn by the computer, but you can draw it another way, and that, this is the one minus the cosine of the latitude, and that, if you draw that line that way, you can superimpose it right on that line. Well, why in the world would that be? Does anyone know why a, like, a line like that and drawn as one minus the cosine of the latitude for, a, for whatever reasons would be superimposable on a line showing the incidence of cancer by latitude? You remember back in the sixth grade when we did uh, trigonometry and cosines were not that pleasant a subject. And I don't like them that much myself, but I was happy to see that you can create the same line with a cosine. Well, it turns out there's something called the cosine law that tells us the intensity of sunlight is equal to one minus the cosine of the latitude. So this is an indication, this line is an indication that this is a physical phenomenon that's following at the prediction due to the cosine law. So it gives us a certain amount of confidence that the effect is real. Of course, there are exceptions. There are always exceptions, and we go to great lengths to try to explain them. Uh, if you go down to the bottom, you see countries like Mozambique, Rwanda, Haiti, uh, other places that are really near the equator, and you see that the cancer virtually has, disap has disappeared uh, in, that, in the, those, those countries, Egypt, for example. So we'll go to the next one. So uh, after we had published these papers, uh, the first paper, we found out that Hippocrates knew this all along, and he told people, if you're going to choose a place to live, pick the sunny side of a hill. That's the southern side, generally speaking. And so it might be useful in the choice of your next home. Stay on the sunny side. There is more, more sun on the southern half in the northern hemisphere. And then Apperley in 1941 uh, had the, the brilliance to find out that, or suggest that sunlight might antagonize cancer and published a paper about it. And we didn't know the existence of the paper. But he never linked it with vitamin D. He just observed that sunlight might antagonize cancer. It was still in advance, but it went nowhere. He didn't publish further on it, nor did it get picked up. But we finally decided we love these studies that compare countries because they involve everybody. There's no bias and exclusions. There's nothing like that. But we still needed to do studies of individuals. So the first one we did uh, was by good fortune we identified a study that had been started in 1954 by Jerry Stamler, a man who had retired to live on the top of a mountain in Italy, a la Il Postino movie. I don't know if any of you have seen that movie. But he lived on this mountaintop, and we got a message to him that we wanted to use his cohort that he had assembled t some 25 years previously or so to find out if dietary vitamin D and calcium could prevent colon cancer. And he said, yeah, go ahead, for crying out loud. Uh, and so we did, and it, it, it took us several years, actually, to extract the data. But people had collected uh, data using uh, NASCO food models, these plastic food models, different sizes of hamburgers and bananas and what have you, two times and stored it up, and he was willing to share it. And then since then, they had been measuring the incidence of every disease, including uh, colorectal cancer. So these are the results. We found that the men who consumed up to 47 um, international units per 1,000 calories, they had pretty high rates of colorectal cancer. These are the two bars on the left, whereas the two bars on the right were men who consumed 48 or more international units per 1,000 kilocalories. And say they assume about, they eat maybe like 3,000, so it's about 150 international units or more for the two short bars on the right. So it was, I would say it's almost reducing it by two-thirds if you got up to just 150 IU of vitamin D. So for some diseases, a surprisingly small amount of vitamin D in the diet will have a profound effect on the incidence. But people still didn't believe us. We were vilified. We were ridiculed. We were told to do something else. And, uh, but we stuck with it, and eventually we were able to publish, both these pu papers were in the Lancet, this study, and it capitalized on a, my first job as an epidemiologist, which was to go to a community called Washington County, Maryland, about 80 miles from Washington, D.C., and from here, actually, and move in there and do, collect blood from people. And we collected blood from 25,620 willing souls who donated their blood for perpetuity for the purpose of this study. 
And so we waited eight years and then we thawed the samples from people who got colon cancer versus people whose blood was taken on the same day, and, uh, the same month, and they were the same age, the same sex, same race. And by that time we had 34 cases and, and we took 67 controls. And this is what we found. And we'll start on the left side with using 30 nanograms per nano mil as a cutoff. And what we found is that if your serum vitamin D was higher than 25 OHD was higher than 30, you only had half the risk of developing uh, colorectal cancer, which is not bad considering colorectal cancer is, while not glamorous, it is the second leading cause of cancer death in the U.S. And we could just cut that in half, I think, overnight based on these data. But you can also look at the effect of even lower because people who are really low you contribute wildly to the risk. And if you use the cutoff of 20 nanograms per ml, then you have triple the risk of getting this horrible disease. So why not do it? You would think people would have moved on this, but they really didn't. Uh, it's beginning to get a little better now, though, that the effect has also been shown in Europe. I choose this slide both because, you know, you need to look at these things carefully, but also for the number of authors, which shocked me that, you know, during the period since we proposed this to when they did a European case control study, they had accumulated such a large panoply of authors. And the results showed a strong inverse linear dose response association with the risk of colorectal cancer. And they indicate that a strong inverse association exists between levels of pre-diagnostic 25 OHD and risk of colorectal cancer. So these blood samples were collected before they had the cancer, so they're not a cause of the cancer. Uh, and this is the results of this study. If you start out with, you know, a median around 8, your risk is going to be 2.8 compared to a median of around 50, uh, it's going to be down to 1. So what it amounts to is you have triple the risk of colorectal cancer if you're in the pits in the lowest uh, fifth of the distribution. So it applies here and it applies equally in Europe. And this is, in a sense, certified by virtually every epidemiologist in Europe. If you look at that list, it's just about <laughs> everybody in Europe. Uh, and it's also true in the United States. This is very standard. This is the NHANES cohort. And the study looked at relative risk of colon cancer by the 25 OHD and found, yeah, about the same thing. Your risk is triple if you're less than 20 nanograms per ml. And this is also a pretty definitive study. And it says that, well, in this case, it's uh, five studies combined. It's a, it's a meta-analysis. And this is what the curve looks like. It just keeps going down, down, down. By the time you get to 35 nanograms per ml, you've eliminated 50% of colon cancer. So 35 has been a popular target, and it will help, but it doesn't finish the job. Colon cancer, we believe, is eradicable with an adequate dose of vitamin D. We don't have to worry about virtually any of it, except maybe a few recalcitrant uh, familial cases that will occur. What about breast cancer? Well, now we have individual studies. But my favorite was the very first one done linking 25-OHD uh, to risk of breast cancer by um, Lowe and her colleagues in England. And this is what they found, is that by the time you got up to 48 nanograms per ml, and now this is in a range we don't see so much in the United States, but should be aiming for uh, at a minimum, you get a 50% lower risk compared to the lowest uh, quartile. But if you get up to 60 nanograms, which is an even better target uh, for us, then we're seeing a reduction down to about elimination of 85% of the risk, uh, and in a sense reducing the incidence of breast cancer to a fifth of what we're suffering from now. And it's highly statistically significant, and the curve explains 90% of the variation in breast cancer. So we don't actually need to know anything more about breast cancer than this, that if you maintain a high enough level of vitamin D in the blood, you ain't going to get it. <laughs> Speaking plainly, <laughs> and here's the dose response gradient in the Harvard Nurses Study, and uh, it's just such a nice study, I wanted you to see it, but it's found a 30% lower risk with 42 
And what this tells me is we can't be fooling around with 42. We ought to be thinking about the 60s as our target for 25 OHD in nanograms per ml. And uh, here's uh, another pooled analysis. And you can see with 52 nanograms, we're going to get rid of half, but we've got to get up more like 60 to have a big effect, even a little beyond that. So uh, uh, there's a couple of wonderful studies from Heidelberg I'd just like to show you quickly that separated premenopausal breast cancer from postmenopausal. Most studies don't do this, and the advantage of this is that it does. And so what I'm showing you now is premenopausal breast cancer. And since it's part of your job to decide what dose to give people to prevent disease, it's good to know that even for premenopausal breast cancer, if you get it up to gr greater than or equal to 24 nanograms, you're going to eliminate 55% of the risk, according to this study, which is very well designed and, uh, and highly significant. And that's the same investigators in Heidelberg also looked at postmenopausal breast cancer and found a similar dose-response relationship, which you see here. Again, if you get people up to around 24, you can at least know that you're going to get rid of about 60% of postmenopausal breast cancer. So even our efforts, when they're not at the level they should be, still produce some benefit. And this is highly significant. And the effect is even stronger on mortality. This is, again, NHANES, too. There's no more definitive population on which to base a study as this one in the United States. And uh, it's the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, as you know. And if you get people up to 25 nanograms per ml, you're going to see a reduction uh, almost by three quarters in their mortality rate. So why don't we do it? I keep asking myself that each day. I still haven't found the answers. We did a study at the Naval Health Research Center of breast, very young women who had breast cancer. These were female military personnel. And we didn't see an effect until we examined the blood taken 90 days before. Um, we'll go back to that one, 90 days before. Let's go back one to that. Uh, and then we saw a linear dose-response relationship. So the effect becomes very strong in the three months preceding the clinical diagnosis of breast cancer. And we scratched our head for a while, and then we realized, well, that's the point at which neovascularization occurs, or the formation of blood vessels that supply the tumor with enough blood to grow and metastasize. So the real impact is quite late in the sequence of steps leading to cancer in premenopausal breast cancer. It's earlier, much earlier in postmenopausal breast cancer, just for background. But the amount is the same, the influence is the same when you're talking about recent. And then all cause mortality here by serum vitamin D in 512 women that had early stage breast cancer. And what you can see is if it's a cancer patient and she's got 28.8 nanograms per ml, she's going to have 40% less chance of dying given her diagnosis of breast cancer. So uh, to me, this means that we ought to have every woman at at least 30 nanograms per ml who's a breast cancer patient actually higher. And here's the same, here's another study, uh, according to Turtiles, these are postmenopausal breast cancer patients. And they found about the same thing, that it's about triple the risk. Unfortunately, they used a different referent here, so you use a 2.9 or 3 in the women with less than 14 triple the risk of dying if your so serum vitamin D is less than 14 compared to greater than 22. So now colon cancer survival. Well, as luck would have it, the, these two cancers have very parallel epidemiology. And what was found with breast cancer, and these are multivariate adjusted, is that as you get higher and higher in your 25 OHD, for this one you have to get up to 40, you can cut the risk of dying in half. So if, if any of you are treating breast and, and colon cancer, the very first thing you should do would be to measure the 25 OHD, confirm what it is, and inevitably it's going to be in the pits, and then bring it up to at least uh, this value of uh, 40 nanograms per ml. So uh, this is a dose-response relationship. Uh, it's a meta-analysis, which found about the same thing in terms of incidence of breast cancer, sir. You get up to 42 nanograms, you have a 50% projected reduction. And we believe that you can just continue this down, as the Lowe study did, to eradication of breast cancer at around 80 nanograms per ml. That's our speculation. But fortunately, we have a randomized controlled trial of vitamin D and calcium 
of about a thousand women done by Joan Lappy and her colleagues, and this is what they found. Uh, there were three groups. They got, one got vitamin D3, a thousand units a day, about calcium, about 1,500 milligrams, and a placebo. And they got the serum 25 OHD up to 40 nanograms. And the outcome was all cancers combined, and this is what they found for the entire trial. If you were in the placebo group, you had about an 8% risk of getting cancer during the four years. If you were in the calcium group, it got better. It was like just point, you know, a 5% risk or so. And if you were in the calcium and vitamin D group, you had the lowest risk of all in the range also of, uh, you know, just 2 or 3%. So the whole study showed this big difference. And I've looked at hundreds of these uh, Kaplan-Meier analyses for chemotherapy. And most of them are comparing like just the top two here rather than the, all three of them. They rarely show this big a gap between treated and untreated individuals. Well, vitamin D takes a little while to work. And if you use all the cases that occurred in the study except those that occurred within one year of starting, this is what it looks like. And if you look to the left there, you'll see that about 6% of the placebo group developed cancer during the study versus only uh, maybe 2% at most of the uh, calcium and vitamin D group. So just ask yourself, if it was you, would you rather be in the group 6% of which uh, developed cancer uh, during four years or in a group in which only 2% developed it? To me, this is the answer to the question. We don't need another clinical trial. It's, it would be superfluous and redundant to do another one, but people keep calling for them. Uh, here's the relative risk, 0.23. It's a quarter of the risk if you take vitamin D and calcium. Well, how does it do it? How does vitamin D do it? Well, vitamin D upregulates a lot of cytoskeleton adhesion molecules. I love the name calgizerin, just saying it, calgizerin. Uh, <laughs> and this shows you what is influenced by it. We believe E. cadherin is particularly important because it makes the cells adhere to one another. But there are a lot of other compounds, uh, gene products that are regulated by vitamin D. And some of them downregulated. Most of them are the bad ones. And the good ones tend to be upregulated. And we could go on and on. And it just continues on. But so I'll just give you a feeling for it with these here to let you know that it is an entirely powerful compound that influences the behavior of genes in a very wild and, and intensive manner. Well, we'll take a moment, a break here for a moment, just to talk about how difficult it is to get people to take vitamin D. They'll start and then they quit, or they take it intermittently and they don't take enough. And those of you that are in clinical practice, I'd suggest having a copy of this um, uh, slide in your, in your desk drawer, particularly if you have a patient who would like to avoid wrinkling of the skin. Uh, the, mice, uh, the mouse on the left side uh, has uh, their vitamin D receptor partially knocked out. It's called a vitamin D KO mouse. The one on the right has a normal vitamin D receptor. As you can see, they both have pretty good coats at the beginning of this experiment. Um, but, and that's in the top, uh, it's at four months of life, and a rat lives a couple of years. And then by the time they get to eight to nine months, the poor rat that's not getting vitamin D effects has got unbelievably wrinkled skin and he's lost virtually all his hair, except for just a tiny bit on top, near his tail and on his rear thigh. And if you want, if you'd want your patients like to avoid wrinkles, take a look at this, you know? If you don't care about preventing cancer, maybe you might <laughs> take some of this and prevent the wrinkles. So how does it work? Well, normally, almost all cancer occurs in epithelial tissue including adenocarcinoma of the breast and of the bowel. We could go on and on. They're almost all in epithelium, although it's only 2% of the total mass of the body. And the epithelial tissue is uh, it's shown here. And the, what this is intended to show is that the cells are stuck tightly to one another. When they do that, they inhibit each other's growth. It was actually the first discovery of carcinogenesis in 1905 by Bovary. And that's that your neighbor is what keeps you from going nuts and reproducing unduly, and uh, that's true of epithelial tissue universally. So these are the different kinds of junctions, and there are four main kinds. Tight junctions are probably the most important because they, they really pull the cells together. And then these other junctions function to allow the cells to share molecules and nutrition and all kinds of wonderful things. 
Um, it grew, you remember in high school, we would look at paramecia and how they had those feelers sticking out from them, uh, the cilia. And uh, what happened that allowed this kind of junction to occur, we think, is that somewhere in evolution, the cilia of one cell embraced the cilia of the other cell, and the two pulled together, and we had the possibility of a colonial rather than an organism that was simply unicellular. And these things still exist, and it's still what holds the cells together. Oddly enough, if you look at them uh, with an electron microscope, you see this is what the junctions look like under close scrutiny. They each have calcium ions, like anything that sticks together. It's usually got calcium in it, and cement even. To make cement, you've got to add calcium to make it stick together. And uh, the hinges are also dependent on vitamin D. No vitamin D, no hinges. Vitamin D upregulates the formation of these coupling uh, structures that hold the cells together. So it's probably how vitamin D is doing what it's doing is by keeping the cells in good, good touch, inhibiting each other's growth, and not entering the insanity of cancer. And this was Bovary in 1902. Then there was this two-hit theory that came out that, well, you're going to get cancer if you get two hits to your DNA. Everybody began to think just about the DNA. Ultimately, there was the many-hit theory from Vogelstein and others at Johns Hopkins, actually, in the 1990s. But the reality is, is that we're, we're really past both these theories now. They haven't helped us that much, except they've told us to you know, avoid too many x-rays because the hits are often due to x-rays. But as far as controlling cancer, they haven't. We have, as you know, for breast cancer, highest rates in the world. So the theory has not been beneficial. Uh, but the idea has been that cancer is due to mutation. Don't you know that? It's due to mutation, people are always telling me. Well, mutations are part of it, but... Uh, you know, it's pretty hard to whack it once it's grown up. <laughs> so another way of looking at this is what we call the dynamite model. And you may as well know about it because the purpose of this seminar is interrupting cancer. And if you're going to interrupt something, you should know, it would be a good idea, I think, to know the stages at which the interruption can occur. So we've developed a model that says that, you know, the first lesion in cancer is harm to the intercellular junction. It's not a mutation. It's the loss of tight junctional adherence between the cells, allowing them to proliferate wildly. And that wild proliferation creates competition. That unleashes natural selection. And natural selection is the engine of almost everything in biology. A famous biologist, Obansky, once said that if natural selection isn't the explanation of a phenomenon in nature, in biology in, in particular, the explanation is wrong. And he based that on years of observation of fruit flies. So natural selection is the main engine of almost everything in biology, including the growth of malignancy, we feel. So this is the theory of what causes cancer, and it shows you where, as a nutritionist, you can intervene. The first is loss of tight junctions that establishes the connection favoring natural selection. If we keep the vitamin D level high, uh, they say less than, they should be greater than uh, to mean the, what the target should be, 50 nanograms per ml in males and at least 60 to 65 nanograms per ml in females, then we stop this stupid disjunction of the cells that is the precondition for the other steps. But if we fail at that, then there's an instability that results because when you have really fast reproduction in a tissue compartment, there's not great proofreading of the DNA. So you get all these errors of reproduction in the DNA, and some of them are just the extreme of the normal distribution and require no carcinogen. We're actually now in the post-carcinogen era. When we have a woman come in with breast cancer, chances are she wasn't operating a Coke oven or she wasn't painting radium dials. She just had a life, just normal life like yours and mine. And we can't, be look we can't continue the madness of looking for carcinogens in a life that doesn't have many of them. Rather, this is a normal phenomenon. Cancer is not dependent on carcinogens. We can make it happen with a lot of them, but if we keep looking for them, we're going to just go nuts. So assume it's a normal phenomenon, probably the extremes of the normal distribution of the rate of reproduction of cells. Some of our cells can reproduce every two hours. Others can reproduce every two weeks, and there's variation between. The ones that reproduce quickly are the threat. Then there's natural selection is the next step in this, these steps, and that's competition for the scarce resources in a tissue compartment. That causes evolution of a malignant clone. And if you think about uh, like paleontology, you realize that there used to be these lovely, quiet, calm herbivores. 
that were spending their days eating plants. And then as time went on, over maybe 250 million years, eventually the Tyrannus rex evolved, a tyrant lizard that scared the hell out of everybody <laughs> and eventually ate just about everybody else, uh, advancing the, 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 the decline in dinosaurs, which was finally knocked out supposedly by the comet that caused or the uh, object that caused the KT boundary. But there's no stopping it. If you have a, a bunch of organisms, they're going to compete. If they compete, the meanest, toughest dinosaur, you call it the meanest, toughest junkyard dog, whatever, is going to emerge as the uh, clone that's overrepresented in the tissue. Well, now, once, the, that bad, once that bad guy evolves, then you have overgrowth of the tissue. Then you have recruitment of blood vessels. It wants more and more resources so it can reproduce faster and, you know, do its thing. It's a, it becomes a parasite at your expense and my expense. And it just keeps doing that. But that's possible to stop with vitamin D. Of all good things, this phenomenon, first described by someone at Harvard, um, has come under the control of vitamin D. So that's how it's preventing breast cancer in the premenopausal period, and some of it in the postmenopausal from the data that we have. And then, with luck, bad luck for us, good luck for the parasite, this lesion becomes cancer. Well, then we know the rest is the metastasis, and that's no good. If we're lucky, there is occasionally involution where, hey, you know, we have someone that, that escapes the misery and then transition, which is what we hope for, which is coexistence with normal tissue. These probably can be achieved with a large enough dose of vitamin D. Uh, but the main point here is that there are these four steps, each of which we can interrupt as nutrition scientists and nutritionists to stop the cancer from ever happening. And imagine all the misery and chemotherapy and radiation and everything awful that pa cancer patients have to undergo that we could avoid by nutrition. So if you look at different cancers, and if the question is, well, how high do I have to get the vitamin D to prevent each type of cancer? It's something like this. If, if you look at the horizontal axis, it tells you how much serum 25-OHD you need, and the, each of these are based on a study to get rid of a, a certain percentage of cancer. For colon cancer, if you get people to 37 or so nanograms, you'll prevent 55% of it, which isn't bad. For breast cancer, it's a different story. You've got to get up to 65 nanograms to prevent 76% of it. But still, you think, well, if I'll just take them up to 65 nanograms, I'm going to get rid of three quarters of this nasty, horrible disease. Now, for men, it's not as clear with prostate cancer, but aggressive prostate cancer can be cut in half with about 32 nanograms per ml, so it's still worth it. Ovarian cancer, well, that's a tough one, too. But according to the Harvard group, you can prevent 20% of it if you get people up to 40 nanograms. And it's something, at least. Uh, let's see what else we've got here. Endometrial cancer, we can prevent half of that by getting everybody up to 35 nanograms per ml. And let's see what else we've got. Renal cancer also can be reduced by two-thirds. That requires almost 50 nanograms in the blood to do that. So it's a matter of you picking what cancers you want to prevent in your patients and then picking a level that agrees with it for all cancers combined. And this is from the uh, work from the Baggerleys mainly and their colleagues at Grassroots Health. Uh, we found that 65 to 77 percent of all cancers combined can be prevented with about 47 nanograms per ml or in the range of 50 nanograms per ml. And it applies to breast and colon and lung cancer. In fact, those were the leaders in the amount of reduction. So the women in the um, randomized controlled trial, uh, they, these were postmenopausal women, and they had only a fifth of cancer if they got the high levels of vitamin D compared to the women who had the low levels. And so that means that we were, we're capable of preventing eight out of 10 cancers in postmenopausal women, and probably generally, most likely generally. So well, one of the things I was asked to talk about, and I'll get through this pretty quickly, is what are the adverse effects? And in doing these clinical trials, the only one we see is renal calculi, kidney stones. And anyone that's had one will tell you how painful they are. And I've heard a lot of stories about it. And it's a little higher in a treatment group that receives calcium pills. For one thing, we always do these studies. We give the people calcium pills. And again and again, it comes out we have like 1.4% of the women in the treatment group get one of these stones and 0.8% in the placebo group. So 
in my opinion, I would not get the benefits of vitamin D because I was worried about the difference between 1.4% and 0.8%. But if, if you really want to put a fine point on it and help the patient to the maximum, don't use a calcium pill. Tell them they got to drink non-fat milk, non-fat yogurt. There's so many products that deliver each about 325 milligrams of calcium per serving that they don't have to take the darn pills. It's probably the pills that are the problem because you can take these little chalky pills and no fluid with them and then you get too much calcium for the amount of fluid that's going through your kidneys. So use only dietary calcium if you want to avoid this kind of a risk. Recommend adequate hydration. Inadequate hydration is the basis for a whole lot of this. Reduce the dietary intake of oxalates. And luckily, it's not too hard. Rhubarb, which some people enjoy, I'm not one of them, is one of the worst, 541 milligrams per serving. And spinach, which I do love, is 760. And I have a friend that always serves spinach with rhubarb pie, and I'm just waiting to see what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, we have kale, which is on the menu over at the trademark in a sautéed form. It only has two milligrams per four ounces, like most foods. It's just a few bad actors. And if you cross those out of a woman's diet, she's not going to get a kidney stone since 60 percent of them are made out of oxalate. Now we're down to the end. Future research, we need more monitored natural experiments. An example of this is a, is a man in New York uh, named Gary Null who accidentally ordered 50 milligram pills of vitamin D. 50 milligrams, he mixed up the Greek M with a, a, a regular M, is uh, 2 million units per pill. And he took them, he gave them to all his friends, his family, he sold them on the internet, and there's been no bad complications that we know of. The worst thing was somebody whose feet hurt, and they took them off the vitamin D and their feet came back to normal. Uh, so that's what you call a monitored natural experiment. And because of this difference between 50 milligrams and 50 micrograms, there are probably going to be other people in the world that are taking 1,000 times the dose we recommend of vitamin D. And we'll, we're getting a chance to see what it does. We, of course, want to avoid an overdose in children. But in adults, there's a huge tolerance for it. Anyway, we need more nested case control studies. The most urgent need now is for field trials, where we just get out there and start giving people 8,000 IU a day of vitamin D and 1,500 milligrams of calcium, and then monitor their 25D to get it up to the recommended levels. Those are just starting points. And then if we could, a randomized trial would be good. But at this point in history, we'd, to make it worthwhile, we'd have to use 10,000 IU a day as the intervention. And it should not be any reason for delaying public health action, because it will help us determine what to do in the future. In the meantime, we ought to just get everybody on the amount of vitamin D we've talked about. Well, I better wrap up. I'm almost at the wall here. So, so anyway, the summary, our job is to interrupt. I love the choice of words by the organizers. The natural history of cancer, this is done for breast and colon cancer by maintaining greater than 50, 50, 50 nanograms per ml in males, and greater than 65 milliliters in females, nanograms per ml. Cancer patients should, all of them should be repleted immediately to 65 nanograms per ml to save their lives, and that uh, we should find new research to interrupt different steps after it becomes clinically apparent. So to wrap up, remember we've talked about how keeping from destroying a valuable object like a Ming vase or maybe something like it is extremely valuable because it'll bust into a million pieces and we'll never be able to reconstruct it is what we're going to be doing with, real, with respect to cancer. And I have another little video for you uh, regarding a, a priceless Ming, or a million dollar Ming vase that uh, underwent an amount of destruction. We'll just take a moment. We could have the Ming vase, please. This is an auction. Uh, the language is Finnish, but there are subtitles, so you may be able to follow. <laughs> Well, thank you for your divine attention. It's a pleasure being here with you. I hope you enjoyed the talk.